and a pleasant good evening to you and yours, and welcome to the Brevard Sports Network. Alan Slaughterzinski here with you tonight, coming to you from the beautiful downtown Melbourne studios. And uh, let me begin by saying this. Um, the reason for what we're doing tonight is a couple of things. Yesterday was National Signing Day. And as you look across the landscape between early signing day and national signing day, um, you look at the numbers and they're down. They're way down. And there are reasons for that. And we're going to discuss what those reasons are here tonight. A lot of it has to do with the college aspect of it. And a lot of it has to do with the high school. And yes, the uh, youth football aspect of it, the parent aspect of it, and even the coaching aspect of it. We're going to touch on all of it tonight. Kind of wrapped up in this bundle here this evening, what we hope to accomplish is maybe some of the most respected guys in the county when it comes to uh, youth, high school, football in general, are going to be on this broadcast tonight, and they are going to um, they're going to voice their opinions I'm going to ask questions, voice my opinion as well. If you've got a question, please feel free to ask it. Caleb is in monitoring the comment section. And I'll stop about every 10 to 15 minutes, if it's possible, and uh, ask Caleb if he's got anything. I've got a terrific panel with me here tonight. Let's first introduce the coaches here tonight. Uh, well, you know what? Let's start with the youth and work our way up. Let's start with... Uh, he is the president of the West Melbourne uh, Youth Football Program, none other than Billy Palmer. And Billy put up a tweet last night that I found to be most interesting, and I also found to be closely linked to what we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, the coaches uh, continue with the head coach of the Heritage Panthers. Uh, went 9-2 and two this past season, and yesterday had 11-12, counting early signing day, 12 guys signed national letters of intent to play at the next level. And he is Coach Michael Benson. Uh, from the Coco Tigers, offensive assistant, offensive coordinator, Adam Franco. And uh, a good friend of ours that used to be the head coach of the Vera Hawks. He is now the head coach at McIntosh High in Georgia. I'm wearing the McIntosh hat tonight in honor of Coach Smith, Derek Smith. And uh, also joining me here tonight is one of the most respected voices in the county and a guy that I thoroughly enjoy listening to. Um, he hosts every, you know, a, a lot, you know, the, 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 the uh, Twitter, the spaces. I just absolutely love the things. Believe me when I tell you this, there are a lot of things I hear on there that I wish that we could honestly say here, but we can't. And I think there is an absolute need for forums like you know, what Martell Stevens does and how everybody is able to go on there and voice their opinion. So you probably won't see me for quite a while here because I'm going to bring all of these guys on. So allow me to do that right now as everybody, I hope, is going to pop on screen here. Let me get, I don't know what order they're going to come on. I just know they're going to come on. So there we go. All right, I got I got all of our guests, I think all of our guests on there. Yep, I do. I've got all five of them. And again, you don't need to see me. You see plenty of my ugly face tonight. Coach Smith, Coach Franco, Coach Benson, Billy, Coach Palmer, and Martell. Good evening, gentlemen. Yes, sir. All right. Good evening. Martell, I'm going to start with you. And uh, you knew I was, but yeah. let me start with you. You looked at National Signing Day yesterday and early signing day. Right off the top of your head, what did you deduce from these signings? What what did you see this year on National Signing Day, good, bad, or indifferent? So, um, in spaces, we uh, we did a lot of talking about the pressure that's been placed on coaches, and so um, I've I've said personally, I feel like they have kind of made it seem like coaches got to turn water into wine and do something that they can't do. Um, and we talked about it a little bit today. Like a lot of people were saying for uh, context that Coco didn't send a lot of players D1. 
And they were like, well, how did they win state back to back and not be able to send kids D1? But we talked about earlier, like earlier in the month, maybe a month ago, about how they coaches had to compete with the portal. And there were other things that factor into it, measurables and multiple other things that uh, matter in that whole context. You know, let me put something up on the screen here. There is the portal as of about four hours ago. Since the portal opened up, 2,227 student athletes at the collegiate level have entered that portal. Remaining in that portal are 1,157 football players in that portal. So, yes, <laughs> the portal has a lot to do with it. Coach Benson, you put 12 kids at the next level. I know every one of those kids wanted to go play D1 P5 football. There's no question in my mind that's what they wanted to do. How did you get 12 kids to the next level? Man, um, <laughs> honestly, just just kind of using – this just, I mean, I, with UNW, I, I, we had four kids that went to UNW, and that was already a pipeline that we had there um, that started a couple of years ago. Um, UNW is a D3 college, but they, they take care of the kids when it comes to financials. Um, and like everybody knows, D3 is, you know, you got to come out of your pocket. But um, what I preached to these kids was um, your grade point average. Because once you get to that point, you know, that 3.0 it, above is going to take care of a lot of your, your expense. So I couldn't do I, – I can't take credit for all of it. I can't take credit for none of it, honestly. I mean, I, I make my calls. I do everything, and I try to get the parents involved. And I tell the kids that they have to send out stuff. They have to um, you know, talk to the coaches. They don't want to talk to the coaches. And I don't think people understand that, like, these coaches don't, they don't, they're not coming for us. They come into, they're coming to interview the kids and they want to talk to the kids. They want to see how the kids are reacting. They want to see how the kids are interacting with them when they're talking to them. So they don't, you know, we, we give out the transcripts. We, we can say that this kid's a baller, this kid is doing this, but um, at the end of the day, it's really up to the kids. You know what I mean? The kids and their parents and how involved they are with it. So, um, you know, just with the pipeline that we have with, with, with UNW and then, you know, we, we, we did some grinding as a coaching staff as well as, as reaching out. But, um, you know, these, these it's all about them, you know, and they, and they did a lot. And then I make my kids be active on uh, social media, make sure they're posting stuff. And, and, and that's how they're going to get it, you know, and that's just the day and age of it now. Adam, coming into this signing period, early signing period, and you had Lauren Ward with FAU, and then the signings that you guys had yesterday. I mean, you guys have put under Coach Ryan Schneider and and his staff, you and everyone included. I I can't remember the number, but I want to say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of cl close to over sixty kids now have gone that route to play at the next level. When you see comments like you saw throughout social media yesterday, I guess my question to you is how do you, because, you, you know, not just Coco, but a lot of schools in this community combat the problem of parents don't understand truly what's going on beyond the high school doors out there in the real world. How do you, how do you say, yeah, you know what? Uh, you know, you heard what Martell said. What, how do you answer that? Well, I think we, we saw a few of our different kids. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, no one's going to the NFL, right? I mean, there's there's a handful of kids. Coco's got four guys right now. I think Brock's got one. Uh, well, we have five total in the county in the league right now. County 700,000 people. I mean, honestly, like flip a coin, like if you think you're going to get to the league. So then the next step is where's the best opportunity you play football and it not come out of your mom's pocket. And I think that's something that, is the most recalibration that has to happen for parents looking at this is, uh, you know, once you're not going division one and you drop below the division one level, how that package academically comes together for you. It's not really a football scholarship anymore at the D two level. First thing they're going to do is they're going to say, give me a FAFSA and I want to see what, how much Pell Grant money you get. Then I'll see your GPA and I don't know how much academic money you get. And then what do you need left? Oh, you need four grand? All right, football is going to cover your four grand. 
And that's kind of what's happening at the lower level. So this is where GPA now becomes more important than it's ever been because where the guy would normally add a two, eight, maybe he was a good enough player where he was going to get Georgia Southern where Georgia Southern is going to take the kid that's leaving Clemson with three years of, of eligibility left now. So now where are you going to go? Well, you got to go to a D2 school now or an NEI school and you got to, and you want to go there without having your mom or dad pay any money out of your pocket. Well, a huge part of that is getting to that three up. And then in the state of Florida, you know, if you look Florida bright futures, you know, the SAT requirements for Florida bright futures have not gotten easier. They've gotten extremely difficult. To get a 75% bright futures, you got to be over 1,200. That's really hard SAT score to obtain. So That's I think I think there's a little bit of recalibration there and how you approach it. And I think parents also just stop looking at this like, you know, purely what's my football money I'm getting from the school because we have a lot of kids that are being successful with uh, academic money, Pell Grant money, uh, work study programs, and all these other types of funding you can get. It, you know, here's the other thing. I wrote a story the other day. 99.997% of high school football players of the 1,083 that are in this country, 0.003% of them will reach the National Football League. I promise you, I promise you, chances are your student athlete isn't one of those kids. Coach Smith, I got a question here for you. You're up in the state of Georgia right now, and obviously there's nothing different compared to what the expectation level is for parents that believe that their child is a D1 player or a player that's one day going to play in the NFL. As a head coach, it's been successful now in two states. And by the way, congratulations on being named coach of the year up there in your uh, region last year. How do you answer this question? What do you say? Well, you got to agree with what, what's been said so far. What we got to understand is, is there is a delusional attitude sometimes that you don't want to crush. Um, you want kids to drink without a doubt. You don't want to be a drink crusher. But at the same time, you have to feed the idea to parents and kids that college football at any level is something that's great. It's not about just college football. It's about getting an education. Um, when you have this opportunity to get an education, it doesn't matter if you get this education at a Division three school or a Division one school, while playing the game that you get to love, that's the most important aspect that you run into. We're dealing with a new world of recruiting. You know, the bottom line is the transfer portal is, is, is so abundant for, for Division one schools now, unless you're a four or five star athlete, you're not guaranteed to play Division One football anymore. It used to be before, you know, a, a three-star kid, you know, could wait until literally two or three days before signing days, make his decision on where he was going to go, go to a, a, a mid-level P5 school, and it was going to be no problem. He was guaranteed to sign that. That's not the case anymore, Alan. You know, uh, the, the four or five stars is about the only kid that's going to be guaranteed to sign a P5 scholarship and wait until – you know, signing day. Now, if you don't commit early, which we don't, we hate, we hate the word commit early because kids commit early. Five months later, they're decommitting and trying to go to another school. But the bottom line is it's a business now. It's a business. College is treated like a business. There is absolutely no way a college is not going to take a transfer portal kid over a high school kid if it all of a sudden opens up in the position they're at. And then look at that kid and say, I know I offered you a scholarship, but we have now filled that position with a transfer portal kid. So it's, it's a business, therefore a kid should commit, decommit, do what they have to do to find a way to play college football. And that's the reality of what we're running into. Now, it doesn't matter what state you're in. The reality is education should be the number one priority because like Coach Franco said, like Coach Benson said, you're more than likely now in high school football going to be looking at a Division II opportunity or Division three opportunity, which is going to be based on your GPA on what kind of finances you'll get. But – it also doesn't mean you can't use that as a stepping stone to play Division One football. There is so a lot of kids now that you can see go to Division Two for a couple of years. They bump up to Division One because Division One realized, okay, all that kid needed was a couple of years of development. You know, that's what we're missing now. The, you know, and I'll give you a good example: the six foot five, three hundred pound lineman that's a late groomer that's still a little bit, you know. Uh, soft on his feet, hasn't got the strength behind him yet, but we know he's got that Division One body, colleges are going to not take a chance on him right now. Jawan Taylor was that kid. One more time? Jawan Taylor was that kid at first. Absolutely. Where old 
Five years ago, they take a chance on that kid. They let him develop. Now they get the portal kid. Now a Division II school gets that kid. He spends two years developing, gets bigger and stronger, and actually starts to fit the strength to that body type. Then he becomes a Division I kid. That's the new landscape we're in. Billy, you put out a tweet yesterday that I think where the root of, you know, we've heard everyone from Martell on up talk about expectations. Um, you put out a tweet yesterday that I think summed up where the root of these expectations begin and what the problem is there. Would you care to share how many youth football programs are in Brevard County? Well, I think as of today, there's 18. I mean, another one could pop up tomorrow, but as of right now, there's 18. <laughs> What's the problem with having 18 youth leagues, Billy? I don't know. The problem is the number, Alan. I think it's the, you know, there's eight from O'Galley Boulevard to Malabar. You know, there's not that many fish in the pond, basically. You know what I mean? There's, right. you know, everybody's fighting over the same kids. People then start complaining that things are watered down. There's no competition. Oh, now I'm going to go play here. I'm going to travel halfway across the state for a football game. When, in reality, when there was 12 teams in Brevard County and, and, you know, some of those kids that played in that same league are, are, are playing on Sundays right now. The competition's here in Brevard County. We, we have the athletes. We have the coaches. It's, you know, again, somebody's dad, someone's parents get mad that, you know, their kid's not getting enough, whatever you want to call it, attention, reps, whatever it might be. Then they go and start their own league and, you know, it, it does one-team one leagues. It doesn't bode well, does it, Billy? Because, first of all, the play gets watered down, the coaching gets watered down, and – then what do you have? What I mean, what good does that do once these kids reach the high school level? If 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 Johnny's running for four hundred yards a game against kids that may not even be playing high school football, then the parents coming to the coach and saying, "Well, you know, why isn't my kid doing this, 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 or this?" So there's, I think that's where the problem begins. Martell, let me ask you this. Your pipeline to coaches, your pipeline to student athletes, you hear, you talk to them a lot. Um, you know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the guys that you talk to in this county and the truth that you get from them. What do you see as the root evil for, say, this youth football up to the high school level in terms of what we're seeing from the parents and what we're seeing from recruiting? I, um, I said it on, on on one of the spaces, and I don't think they really take – I think they take it for granted, but um, I said that I think that proximity to successful people like Jawan Taylor and Chauncey and – uh, Jamel Dean and even JV and Hawkins, seeing those kids be successful, I believe those those situations have kind of made parents have unrealistic expectations, not realizing that you're talking about one percenters. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And um, those one percenters, like they, if these kids are extravagant talents, but I think because we know them or we grew up around them, close to them, people kind of have a tendency to like minimize what they the progress of what they've done as a person and as a player and so um i think sometimes that has allowed parents to have these real unrealistic expectations like uh, like coach said earlier kids want to be able to uh have five hats on the table and say oh i'm going here no i changed my mind i'm actually going here and have you know do the shock value thing but now that opportunity has been taken away and you get like, if you got a decision, you better make that decision. You know what I'm saying? If you yeah. sure about it and it's a good situation, you better make that choice early because you, you may not have that opportunity later, especially if you're not an early signing day kid. Let me ask you this, Martell, um, coaching uh, with these leagues and with the amount, I mean, we see these high school staffs growing exponentially across not just Brevard County, but across the state of Florida. What used to be a five-guy high school football staff is now 12 and 14 guys. There's a lot of football minds that pop up. What would you say, and, and we both have a lot of friends that are coaches, and we have some great ones on here right now. How have you seen coaching affected by this? Um, 
<laughs> so <laughs> I feel like it's always kind of wild in spaces because you always got a bunch of guys that either they they either gonna use me as the culprit for the, for the right. Party. Or they just gonna create it themselves, mm-hmm. whichever one works at that moment. But um, I, I definitely, like I said earlier, I think that there's been this unnecessary pressure put on coaches, and kind of like it's kind of now where like coaches are using it against other coaches. Like, can he get you an offer? Can he get you an offer? We can get you an offer if you could transfer here. We, right. We, we even in spaces have something called the starter pack. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a starter pack. So it's alleged that if you transfer to a school, <laughs> they'll give you three offers <laughs> when you first transfer. <laughs> I hear you. But, you know, it, it, we're laughing. But, I mean, honestly, it's the reality of the situation. Now, Coach Smith, I want to shift gears a little bit because I believe we have – stressed enough over the last couple of days here, at least on Brevard Sports Network, how the transfer portal has affected this and how the expectations don't necessarily need to come down but need to fall in line with the reality of today's recruiting world. Throw on top of the fact that currently 38 states in the United States have name, image, and likeness uh, allowed legally in uh, for high school sports in their state. Your state is one of them. Georgia enacted this last year. I put the story up on Brevard Sports Network. There's not one person that I've talked to that understands why it needs to be done, understands that it could be a good thing. Um, Everybody believes that it will tear down high school sports, football, obviously, particularly. How did Georgia enact this law and is it as bad up there as we believe it could be down here? Right now, it's not, Alan, because one, we still have one of the strictest uh, transfer rules in, in the country. Um, in the state of Georgia, you still have to move a full and complete move with the entire family household that you lived with prior to the other school that you lived in. Um, you just can't pack up and decide to go from school A to school B. So because of that, it's not bad. Our, our, our name image likeness program right now is, is pretty much this. One, you can't represent your school. You can represent yourself. So let's hypothetically say, you know, one of our players, you know, the, the local car company wanted to go ahead and grasp a hold of him and do a commercial with him. He would have to do the commercial and, and whatever playing clothes he has, he can't do it in our, on our uniform whatsoever. It can't be contingent on him being – an athlete at McIntosh High School, it would have to be contingent on his him just being himself. Um, on top of that, it can't be contingent on value of what he did at a game. The other important part of that is it cannot be used to transfer to a school. So if all of a sudden you transfer from schools A to B and you had this full and complete move, supposedly, and all of a sudden you have an N, uh, name image likeness uh, contract, they're going to say that that was an illegal move based on the name image likeness that enticed you to go there. And they're going to immediately rule that kid out. El- even if it wasn't, even if it wasn't, they're going to, they're going to say that, 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 is, that was an enticement. So it I like that to hold you there and, or get you to go to another school. Now, is it something that the kids deserve? Absolutely. You know, the, the, the young lady who sings in the choir, who has a, has a phenomenal voice can go on and, and use her voice to professionally, uh, gain money, why can't an athlete gain money off his ability to do something? As long as it's not enticed to the school that you're doing or things and making you transfer from A to B. And that's what George has got, got with so far. Um, one of the, the athletes that, that caught, you know, has caused this reaction in Georgia was, I don't know, y'all probably heard of Juju. Yeah, absolutely. He, he's, he's definitely one of the ones that's taken advantage of it. But as of right now, you, he's still at Carrollton. There's no enticement for him to go anywhere else. And he's not making millions and millions of dollars either. He's making what we consider a, a, the amount he should, knowing he's the number one quarterback in the country for his age group. Coach Benson, I'm going to come to you on this one. And then Coach Franco, I'm coming up to you. Coach Benson, they enact, and I've asked a lot of coaches in this county their thoughts on name, image, and likeness. It's not if it becomes legal in the state of Florida. It's just simply a matter of when. And I can tell you that when is this summer. 
I promise you, by the time we start up next year, by the time you go back to camp, name, image, and likeness is going to be legal in the state of Florida. I certainly hope that we have specifically that number two rule there that they have in Georgia that Coach Smith talked about, where if you transfer and you have an NIL deal, you got to sit out for a year. It makes sense to me because it essentially puts the legal black bag away for that intent and purpose. Now, Coach, here's my question for you. Florida high school coaches in every sport get paid next to nothing for what they do. That's not just football. That's every single sport. Dr. Andrew Ramjit, who now runs the Florida Coaches Coalition, who, you know, constantly is raising, you know, trying to get the bar raised on coaches' pay. I, I, I know there was an increase in stipend. I'm not exactly sure how much. But here's my question for you, Coach. What are you going to do the minute you have a student athlete walk into your camp that's making more money than you are to play the game? How do you handle that at the high school level? Or have you thought about it? I, I definitely thought about it. And I, I told people, I said, there, it's going to come to a time where it's like that. And I, I thought about walking away. I'm, I'm not even going to lie. Just because of, of you know, kids can act a certain way, you know what I mean? And, you know, when they're making more than their coach in high school, you know, you don't know what you're going to get. Right. You know what I mean? And, and I'm not saying that I would walk away, but I thought about it. Like if they pass it, I, it's going to be, it's going to be crazy in Florida. Let me put it like that because the rules that coach Smith just said about uh, what they have in Georgia, we, we have none of that. Kids can go to school to school and play one school or one sport, one semester, go to another school, another semester and play another sport. Like these kids can really benefit benefit from the NIL if it really passed. Yes, they might not be making millions, but every school in this Brevard County is going to have not every school, but most of these schools are going to have at least a four, a four star or five star kid. Yep. You know what I mean? I know right now I have I'm going to have a five star kid. And if they pass it, he will get stuff because I I try to teach these kids right now to be ready for the NIL. Make sure you're on social media. Make sure you're posting. Don't take down your posts. Make watch what you're posting. Take a picture of your food. You know, do stuff like right. that. You know, whether 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 whatever it is, it kids they're they're gonna make more money than you know than coaches in Florida. And it's, it, it's gonna be it's coming and it's it's bad. But honestly, I think Florida has to do something about transfers, the transfer rule before they drop the NIL. I I, and, I, and, I, and, I agree. And and I it, it's gonna come to a fact where one school has a good booster club and got good sponsors and all they have to do is say, Hey, hey Johnny, I got this for you. Yep. You know, transfer to my school. And there's no, nothing that we can do about it because that's the rule in Florida now. You can jump school to school without even thinking about it. You know, they, sport there's, to sport. You know, sport to sport. You know what I mean? And then at, that's where it's going to get in trouble. And I think that's where a lot of stuff is going to change. Like, for instance, like look, look at Teddy Bridgewater. I mean, everybody knows he got money. Yeah. They dropped the NIL. <laughs> every school in Miami, <laughs> every school in Miami is gonna they're gonna lose. They're gonna lose because every they, everybody knows that Teddy Bridgewater is gonna have the the most NIL deals. He's gonna have the five star, four star athletes, the whole parking lot, probably BMWs, whatever it is. It's it's gonna get to that point and it, it can get crazy, and that's where it's scary when it comes to NIL. Coach Franco, you and I have discussed this a lot. And we believe, you and I have talked and gone as far as to say, the schools that are preparing for it now, the athletic directors that are putting an outline and a plan in place are the ones that are going to immediately get the jump. I don't know here in Brevard County anyway how much of an advantage it is to be a private school under NIL. I mean, I know across the state of Florida, private schools already have an advantage. This is going to be god-awfully sick as it pertains to private schools because of the amount of money some of these private schools have in South Florida and uh, even over in the Tampa area. But 
How do you feel about this, and where do you see this in a year once NIL becomes enacted? <laughs> well, I don't have a ton of faith in FHSA enacting this properly. Uh, I mean, we've seen what they did with classifications. That was completely botched. Um, I thought we took a step in the right direction with Metro Suburban. wasn't perfect, but it was a step in the right direction for at least um, – beginning to realize that yeah suburban schools have a lot less talent that they can pull from i think if you're going to open up nil you have to address like 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 benson said you got to address um the transfers in the classification it's really like here's the thing everyone wants to talk about multipliers if you use the multiplier right now coco wouldn't change classifications there's also a lot of a lot of people who believe that schools have a ton of transfers that really don't. Right? Coco actually doesn't have that many transfers, although people believe that, right? I think what's going to end up happening, and this is what it should be, is if you if you go over a certain number of transfers, you should automatically go into a special classification. If you have a certain number of players on your team receiving NIL, you should automatically go into another classification. I do think that private schools are going to take massive advantage of this. If you are a private school right now and say you charge $10,000 for your tuition. Well, now Florida, they're going to give you eight of that 10 because they're going to take the money they would have given the public school for you and through school choice, they're going to give that private school eight. So now you have to pay 2K out of your own pocket, right? So that already makes it a lot easier for a school that maybe potentially was you know, harder to go to previously paying $2,000 a year to go to a premier high school uh, that, you know, has got a hundred percent, you know, college acceptance rate. That's going to be one reason already to go. Now, if that same private school, like let's take Miami Columbus, who's got super deep pockets. What happens when Miami Columbus starts a collective? Because we're all talking about NIL deals, like how it was intended. But that's not what happened in college, right? College, no one's getting paid for their name, image, and likeness. College, those kids are getting paid salaries based upon how good they are, what position they pay, they play, and the collective. The collective is paying those kids. The, the college coach is handing you a scholarship. Then you walk down the hall. Seriously, then you walk down yeah. the hall, go in. And then you talk to the collective and the collective says, hey, this is what we're willing to offer you to come here and play. What happens when a school like Miami Columbus, not only do they help you on your tuition coming in, but they say, hey, uh, for playing varsity football, you get 3K for every season of varsity football you pay. It goes into a fund. We, because we have uh, a good booster club, we're actually going to invest this fund. And when you graduate, you'll have 25K. Well, if you have 25K when you graduate, well, guess what just came a lot easier to go to? A D2 school, right? Right. Because now you have that 25K sitting in your bank from you, the NIL you collected. So what kid in Miami is not going to Miami Columbus? If right. MCC or Holy Trinity figures that out, what kid's not going there? Yeah, we have a if question. Well, no, no, no. Who's not going? So now you could take that 25. If you're already going for school for free. You know, you can take that 25K. If a public school figures it out, good luck to everybody. Because yes, that's true. If a public school can pay every single one of their varsity players 3K out of a collective and put it in a fund for when they graduate, you basically guarantee they can afford a Division II program based Listen, on health and everything else. It wouldn't be the first time I was ever lied to by a coach, but are coaches lying to me when they say they're not preparing for NIL? Or are there a lot of coaches in this county – and beyond in the state of Florida that, and anybody can say this, uh, answer this. Or, I, mean, I, I mean, to me, if I were a coach, I'd be preparing for this. I'd be, I'd be outlining this and getting ready. Please tell yeah, me I'm that's happening. Prepared. Huh? I'm prepared. That County, island, the Mark County Public Schools isn't prepared. So you can't be prepared. Look it's going to change the way you hire coaches. It'll change the way you yeah. hire coaches. My first phone call if I'm coaching Mark County, still, still, I'm calling Mike Urban and asking him to coach with me. <laughs> yeah, Martel, yes. Martel, let me ask you. It's the truth. Oh, it's the truth. You're, I, you're going to get high, people to work with you that are high affluent business owners. I, I'm calling yep. Reggie Nelson up. Say, Reggie, come, 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 take your retired NFL, but get off, get off the couch. 
come have some fun coaching with me. That's what's going to happen. You're going to change the concept of who you hire as coaches because you're not going to hire coaching. You're going to hire pockets. You're going to get a pocketbook for you. That's what you're going to get. Billy, Billy, I'm going to come to you with the next question, but I want to ask Martell this. Martell, in spaces where obviously you can speak a little more freely uh, and openly about things at times, what is the feeling on NIL? Are people confused by it? Do they want it? I know the kids want it. I know the kids want it. But what's the general feel? I think everybody, like, I think the kids aspire to have it and the parents aspire to see their kids have it. Um, I, but I also think that there's a personality dynamic that I don't know if everyone be, will be tapped into to make that successful. Like, like you said, you gotta you gotta go to the car lot with a blank T-shirt on, and you gotta sell your product or their product based on your personality. And uh, I don't know, I don't know if everyone has the personality that is needed to be a successful name image and likeness but um what what do you want to see how do you want to see this done martel what would you like to see how if, if they roll this out what what would you like to see done i would like to see it stay at the college level i don't think that i don't think it needs to come to the high school level um i think it would be better just for the college level just because if the waters are going to be re- extremely murky, so you, you're not going to really know how to how you can actually pay everyone. And then, you know, the quarterback that, you know, the fourth string quarterback is going to want to get paid as well. You know what I'm saying? And their yeah. parents be like, oh, well, he gets this. Let's leverage here. And then they're going to be able to go and, oh, Coach, if you don't give me a raise, I'm going – or if you guys can't give me a raise that represent said school, then I'm going to just take my talents elsewhere. So I just feel like the waters will be extremely unnecessarily murky if they do it. So I think it should just stay in college. One of the things we try not to do here, because a lot of people do it, and it would just create a lot more hours worth of work for me, is – uh report on transfers but i think if something like this happens it's certainly something we're going to have to venture uh into for sure billy then if you're still at the youth coaching level you're going to have youth football coaches i mean you already we already talked about daddy ball right i mean we already see that as an issue at the youth coaching level right so then you're going to have daddy ball kind of preparing their student athletes for the next level with NIL and how do you navigate those waters with a 13 year old who's getting ready to go to high school or do does a guy like you just say to hell with it I'm out well I mean I think at the end of the day Alan that stuff's been going on already at the youth level I mean it might not be as high as as of a monetarily value but you know there's things that are said to these parents at the youth level promises (laughs) and, and you know gas cards given out you know kids traveling from Port St. Lucie to Mims to play football, you know, wherever it is, you know, I think, I think Michael and probably Franco and Derek could probably say more about, you know, do they have to deal with this 13 and 14 year old incoming ninth graders parents who, who have this expectation of, if you want my kid, this is what you're going to give him. This is what he wants to, you know what I mean? Because he might've had a youth coach that gave them everything he wanted along the line. So. That's the perfect segue, and that's why Billy does great work here on <laughs> PSN. He sets me up perfectly. Coaches, there's the question. Billy asked it. Do you you get these parents that come up and say they don't have any clue about how high school works? Because basically what my high school coach said, and I'm sure yours did too, drop your kid off at the door, and the only other place I ever want to see you, unless you're president of my booster club, is up in those stands. But it's changed. How do you deal with the parents coming in now? And man, I, 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 I go ahead, take the question. I don't really deal with them. I tell them to come to practice. Yeah, that's, that's my that's my that's my answer to everything. If they're talking about when it when it comes to playing time or anything, or why is you know Johnny not doing this or doing that? It's come to practice or go watch film with them. You know, you and you'll see why. But you you do have those parents, but. Uh, you, you kind of the kids kind of take care of it itself because when, once they come see it and once they come when they see their son perform and when you set your 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 program to a higher standard and 
they're not set into that standard. I get when, as I say, um, it's, it's kind of easy to weed those kind of kids out and parents out. Um, but my, my favorite answer is to come to practice. I, my, my practices are always open. Um, parents can come. I had a couple of parents just come down there and watch their, their, you know, their son come down there and practice. Yeah. And she walked, you know, they walked off and I was like, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So they got to see it first. Hey, guys, let me ask you this. Now we're talking about the parents and, and we've talked about the student athletes. I want to talk about the coaching a little bit more. I want to play a video for you real quick, and I want you guys to listen to, to what Mike Tomlin says. And from every level, from youth to the professional level, this occurs, believe it or not. Even at the professional level, That's this will favorite, occur. Favorite pro is my favorite video. Here we go. Ready? I already, I already know what you're about to play. Yep, here we go. Ready? I love to hear coaches resist the responsibility of coaching. <laughs> what'd you say, they, coach? What'd you, what'd you say, coach? What'd you just say, coach? <laughs> I love coaches that resist the responsibility of coaches that talk negatively about a dude that can't learn and blah blah. Man, if everybody could learn, we need less coaches. Yeah, that's right. right. If if the group didn't need management, then we wouldn't make as much. Yep. I love reading draft evals and 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 somebody's talking about anything other than pedigree. Talking about how poor somebody's hand usage is. Well, that's coaching. Right. Mm. I don't run away from coaching. I run to coaching. Love it. It all is in line with that not seeking comfort. Because when you're a coach that's talking about somebody can't learn, you're seeking comfort because your teaching is struggling. Yeah. Incredible uh, from Coach Mike Tomlin. And I'm embarrassed to admit this, but he is my favorite coach in the NFL, my Ravens fans, all my Ravens friends will kill me for that. But he is because if the guy ever gets a quarterback again, he's going to be back in the Super Bowl. That's just a fact. But all right. So let me start with you, Coach Benson. Is that the video you thought I was going to play? Well, I knew it was. I, what, I, that, what's your thoughts on I'm it? A is, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Steelers fan, but Mike Tomlin is one of my favorite coaches in <laughs> I love every bit of it. When he when that came out, um, when that interview came out, I, I actually sent it to all my coaches because, um, you know, you 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 there are coaches out there that just shy away from it, you know. And uh, this kid can't do that. This can't. This kid can't do this. You know. You 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 know. And my biggest thing with, you know, my coaching staff, I, I make sure that let's let's coach every kid, you know. And if they can't do it, and then this let's find something that they're good at and then put them there, you know, and then, you know, I think that's where coaches kind of shy away from is, all right, well, he can't do it. Let's go to the next person, you know, and there, every kid or every kid is different, you know, and I, yep. I love every, every bit of that, what he said. Um, I live and die about it because I don't shy away from coaching. I love coaching. I love development. I love every, every bit of it. Coach Smith, what are your thoughts when you hear that? Because basically what I'm asking you to do is to evaluate your profession right now at the high school level. <laughs> well, I, I, I truly believe, and, and I'll, it's, it's no offense, but I believe down in Florida, I think the level of coaching is, is, is to be honest with you, poor. Um, not saying everywhere, but I think it's poor. I mean, if you look at the level of coaching that – I grew up with, you know, that that my early years of coaching, the, the trees that we were came, Dan Burke, um, Gerald Odom, you know, the guys like that had coaching trees where guys were coaching under them. They were 10 years under those guys before they wanted to be there, be a head coach. Um, and those guys had another 10 years of, of a coordinator. It, it, now you're seeing head coaches take over that have two years of experience or three years of experience. Um, and you see it to where they're getting four or five transfers. They may look a little bit good right now. And again, I'm not saying, you know, that's that's the thing, but when the transfer leaves, what, what are you doing without those transfers? What are you doing with the original kids who are on your roster? My mindset is this, you better be able to coach 44 kids. Because even if you do make a deep playoff run, are those 22 starters that you had on week one gonna be the same 22 starters that you have when you go into the uh, state championship? You know, ask Coco that. I know they get injuries. If you can't coach 44 kids, if you can't coach the original kids on your roster, the backup, especially offensive linemen, 
Offensive linemen, I'm going to tell you this, we know it. They don't turn out to be really good until their junior and senior years most of the time because they're big. They're giant creatures that have been taught not to hurt nobody. They're, they're, they're kind of soft because, you know, the fact is their moms bait them in a little bit because they grew up big. You got to teach them how to get good feet. You got to teach them to get a little gritty and mean. And you got to teach them the game of football because a lot of those offensive linemen don't play, especially when we were young. I mean, the, the, the unlimited weight, Palmer will tell you this. I mean, when did the unlimited weight come about? It was probably 15 years ago. So before that, we had to coach those big boys. Mike, you know, guys like Mike DeGore didn't touch the football field until they got into junior high school. So you had to teach guys like that to become great. Didn't have to with Mike. Mike was great the minute he stepped on a football field. But big guys like that, you had to teach them the game of football. Um, one of the biggest things that I, I use and it is is – Having coaches on campus is huge. I'm not saying, you know, I love I love Coach Franco. I know you're not on campus every day, but I know you wish you could. Um, having seven, eight, co nine coaches on campus, which I have the luxury of doing, can develop a lot of relationships and a lot of skills with kids that you can't do when they only see the coach two hours a day. Um, so that's just, again, my opinion of what I've seen in the state of Florida. Um, you know, is I think the coaching is going downhill. I don't think it's is is quality that I, that it was about ten years. What ago. do you think the reason for that is? Do you think it's because? Well, you tell me. Well, you want the truth? Yeah, I do. I, absolutely, that's why we're doing this. If I go back to Florida right now and I'm a head coach in the state of Florida, I, 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 you're not always getting the best coach. You get the coach that gets you the most kids when they're coming out of eighth grade. Go ahead, you Coach Benson. That's the reality. This coach can bring nine. No, I, I'm just I'm agreeing with him because it, it's it's the reality of it now. You know? Coach Coach Franco, uh, you know the label. You know, obviously that it's 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 an an, in, an on campus coach or a community coach. You're a community coach. What are your thoughts on what you hear Coach Smith saying? <laughs> I mean, obviously, there's an advantage, and there's an advantage and a disadvantage of being in the school, right? Um, Diesel and I show up after the chaos of that it is to teach all day long, right? We show up a little bit of a renewed energy. We're like, this is my enjoyment time. You know, a lot of times Schneider and the coaches that have been in school all day, they don't even want to deal with the kids right now in practice because they're right. just stressed out from having to deal with the, the crap all day long. I, I would say that, um, you know, the first thing is, you know, I learned, I think, pretty early on, even like back when Benson and I were at MCC together, like – you don't coach your best kid. That's not the kid you focus on. That kid's good. He's been coached. You There's parts of, of his game that you'll tweak and help him with. But you focus on your average to the bottom half of your core because that is actually what's your team, right? Javen Boggs didn't magically become Javen Boggs. That kid put in a ton of work off, off the field. He trusted a process on the field. He didn't start as a sophomore. And one year later, he's not magically Mr. Florida, right? But there was a ton of things that he had to work on. And then he took that honest coaching, right? He took the – when we told him, hey, your knock right now is they're not sure you have elite speed. He lived in Ubersati and trained his butt off and never got caught on any of his – on any, any time he broke, right? And I think you have to change the way you coach. Like the old school days of they show up and you show them a bag drill and you do – no, like – if you look through my thread with, you know, all the wide receivers and skill guys, we're all in one thread. The number of Instagram videos I send them, hey, check out this release. This is a pretty good release. I would use this release in this situation when we get to practice and you get into this situation, let's work it. Or, hey, here's some other drills we're going to work this week. I try, if I'm going to do a drill, like I'm old, I'm old, like these days they're over and be playing like football. Like I'll find that drill and I'll find a really athletic person doing it. And I'll send that drill to my group before the actual practice. And they'll be like, Hey, we're doing the drill. I sent you that was on Instagram today because it's going to help us set up this new pass game concept that we're going to use on Friday. All right. So Mike, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Adam. No, I said, I think that's a big piece as a change. Like some coaches need to realize that like, this is how they communicate. They're not going to call you. And if they do call you, it's going to be a FaceTime and, uh, you know, it's going to be text and video links. And that's how you're going to build this whole relationship through here. Martel, one of the things that 
I listen to Spaces a lot driving home on Friday nights this year, and an underlying theme that I heard and completely agreed with this year was I felt this year had an inordinate amount of lack of discipline. I, I, I'm just, I broadcast these games. I watch a lot of high school football. I watch every broadcast we do. I watch the ones on Space Coast daily. And I think one of the underlying themes for me was the, uh, was the undisciplined play that I saw from a lot of programs, not just in this area, but out of this area this year. And I know you have preached and talked about this. Let me ask you this. What do you see as the state of coaching? Now, I'm not talking about just here in Brevard County, but in Florida. What, 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 if any, changes? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on this topic right here? Can't hear him. So, somebody texted me and let him know okay. that is. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Go, yeah, go ahead. Um, I talk to a lot of coaches now, probably more than I want to. <laughs> <laughs> Because of spaces, I, I, I'm privy to information that sure. I don't think I always need to know. You know, like because the truth, if the truth is, is like people are always people are very critical of spaces, but they never talk about the times where I come in there and I'm like, right, these kids, y'all got to make better decisions. Y'all got to do this. Y'all got to do that. Y'all got to do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then. They'll they'll be like, oh, he don't know what he's talking about. He just talking, blah blah blah. We y'all don't have to listen to him. And I'm like, look, I ain't saying I'm I'm the answer. I'm just saying I'm just trying to be a voice to those kids to help them make better decisions. But um, I like I've said I I think coaches have jo a hard job across the board. They have so much they have to deal with. They have to their the pressure that they're under to turn water into wine figuratively yeah. and literally they they're, they're put under great pressure by parents by the schools they work with the kids they coach there's a great pressure put on the coaches and now it's like oh if you can't get it here come get it here you know what i'm saying yeah like, oh, oh i know discipline problem i think that's probably a big part of your discipline problem like you have to you have to decide as a staff, like is this going to be our line in the sand, and are we truly willing if Brady Hart crossed that line to say, "Hey, bro, like you're gone." And I think a lot of staffs can't do that. I think you see people that don't hold kids accountable because they think if they hold that kid accountable and they suspend him a half, uh, I mean they're gonna they're gonna leave. And we've done it, you know. I mean, honestly, last year, we two years ago, we lost Seminole game because we had a, our best D lineman suspended for half. Yeah, they came back in the second half, and they don't score. Yeah, right. But we we had a hole in the table. I I agree with that. I mean, I I, I tell everybody, and not you know, if Adam, our our Clemson commit, like I'll tell them, like people know that he didn't start for us. You know what I mean? And and people don't understand that. You know, we 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 have. It's it, it's set by the coaching staff. It's set by the culture that you you set um, when it comes to discipline. You know, you I don't. You know, you when you look at schools all over the Florida, all over Florida, it's whatever the coaches are letting these kids do. You know what I mean? And it's that's the problem. And you know, when you get these kids that transfer in, you can tell that they were allowed to do whatever they're allowed to do at the other schools. And then when they get to a program that has structure and uh, discipline, some of them don't know how to act. And some of them, you know, end up getting into the, the you know, in the right mind. I'm like, all right, oh, this coach don't play. You know, so I, it has a lot to do with the coaches and whatever culture they, they set from the get-go. Not from like, oh, we just got in trouble. All right, now we're going to set a standard. It has to be from day one. Yeah. Uh Coach Smith, TJ Roddy put a comment up that I'm going to read out loud here. Society has the win now mentally, he says. Schools will dump an experienced coach for anyone they think that can make them win now, experienced or not. I know we see that at the college level a lot. Are we starting to see it more and more at the high school level? Well, I've, I've, I've seen it. We saw it at the high school level in, in the state of Florida. I've seen it in the high school level in Bavard. Um, the reality is this. If the, the community wants wins. And if the community gets in the right ear, 
you know, may it be the principal, may it be the athletic director, maybe a, a school board member. If the community gets in the right ear, they can change the concept of who's coaching that football program if they feel like they're not getting wins. In a minute. Um, and, and the reality is this. I mean, we said you, you made a comment earlier. What are you going to do when a, and a kid makes more money than you through the uh, NIL? Well, kids make more money than coaches in Bavard County working at McDonald's right now, guys. I mean, an assistant coach makes $2,200. In, in, in Bavard County, man, me, I just, I, he can go make that at McDonald's. Yeah, that's reality. So that's it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's already it's already doing it now. So why would a, a coach that's making twenty two hundred dollars really honestly put up with BS if the community's chirping his ears because he's not getting any wins? He's just going to be like, you know what, this isn't worth it. Um, that that's where the structure's got to fix. Got to start fixing in the school system. Let they got if you if you want great programs, invest in your programs. Invest in the fields. I mean, how long did it take Coco to get a, a, a football field that was worth playing on? And they won three or four state championships and their field looked like dang raccoons were eating it every dang day. I mean, it, it took it took, Bavard County, it took Bavard County 25 years to get a rubber track and they had one of the best track runners in the, that, that the nation's ever seen in Pee Wee Carter. Yeah. I mean, it, how many people in Bavard County have to go on to play professional sports before Bavar County takes coaching and athletics serious. Well, well let me ask you, let me, let me play devil's, let me play devil's advocate on the pay issue. Okay. Let me, let me, let, let me, let me flip the script. Anybody in the last three years that takes a head coaching job or becomes an assistant coach in this County knows the red flags and the issues that have been raised about the pay, they know how bad the pay is compared to the amount of work that they have to put in. Coach Benson, why did you want to take the head coaching job, knowing that pay was what it was? Um, to be honest, I, I you know financially we we were good. My family was good, and I'm still good. You know, and it wasn't about the money, but it, would I love to get paid for it? Yes, yes sure. absolutely. Um, so, you know, when I moved back, it was more so if I wanted to be around my nephew. Um, and like, I, I think I told you this before, and like, I, I didn't think I was going to get a head coach job that fast. <laughs> um, I came back, um, to, to be an offensive coordinator, to be around the game, to be around my nephew, um, to watch him in his senior year. And then I was going to work my way into that, um, head coach job. And, you know, I was going to write, wait till the right one came around too, as well. Um, but it wasn't about the money. And I think a lot of people get into it. They get into it for the experience so they can get out of it. You know what I mean? And, and, and I think this kind of goes back to what we've been saying earlier, what coach Smith said about, um, you know, back in the day, you do 10 years, you know, being a coordinator or you being a, a, a defense coordinator or offensive coordinator, and then you go find a head coach. Cause back then when I was in elementary and junior high, those head coaches in Brevard County, they wasn't they wasn't moving. Nobody was moving. Nobody was getting fired. Nobody was doing that. It was for a reason. You know what I mean? And yeah. when they did, when they did move or got fired, then that 10 year defensive coordinator took over. You know, that's what it was. Um, but now it's like, all right, I'm gonna get my my little three or four years and then I'm gonna try to head up up north and try or west or west try to go to texas or something to get some more money so um it's easier to get a job in florida because there's so many jobs open you know what i mean because of everybody knows what they're getting into but they're not a lot of kids a lot of coaches it's sad to say but a lot of coaches are getting in a job just for the experience so they can leave yeah no you're right yeah, Martin, I think, go ahead i think one thing i think one thing that the, the community needs to address with Brevard Public Schools is, I know what's gonna happen. We're we're growing another like I think it's projected like we're gonna have ninety thousand more people in Brevard County. Oh yeah, years, right. So we're gonna be that stupid county who still hasn't learned our lesson, and we're gonna build another brand new high school. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna build another brand new high school. Maybe two. We're gonna ask ourselves, how do we fund this coaching staff? How do we fund this rubber track? How do we fund this gymnasium? How do we fund this? When the reality is, is that we should be evaluating how to add a building at a high school, right? How to take Coco and Rockledge and combine that into one 8 high school and then have a separate middle school outside of Coco, right? Because Coco today has enough, enough 
you know, big enough middle school that you could add another three, four hundred high school kids if you took the middle schoolers out of there. And then what? Then you don't have to build another track. You don't got to build another. Like we don't do anything to maximize our actual facilities at these schools. And watch when our population grows, you'll see some announcement that you know, Flying Crow uh, High School is going to be built just north of Heritage. And, there, and, and it's going to be just like what's happening with like Nice and Buholtz and all those guys where they're they're completely like they, they created that school beach side up there and they're all just basically pilfering talent from each other and no one's got any money to run any programs and no one's got any coaching. I want to give Martel a second to put it, turn his uh, mic back on. Martel, all right, uh, listen, for the last month, and it's no secret in this county, I mean – I, I, it's funny to me how we all tried to be secretive about what, and I'm not picking on MCC, but I mean, we all know what happened there, right? So sources tell me they finally have their man. They'll make that announcement when they're ready. Um, so I hope that's true. But my question to you is, is what did we learn from that situation about the state of coaching in Brevard County? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> We learned a lot, and I, I don't think we were. Uh, I don't think we were ready for what we were learning because we were learning so much on the fly. <laughs> if the numbers are right, if the numbers are right, I think. I think they. I always tell people. I think they. They thought that Plan A was going to work. <laughs> yeah, and that's. I put it. Uh, they they thought they were sold that Plan A was going to work. That the number that they were going to put out there for Plan A was would be enticing enough to that they would say yes. Right. And so I don't think that they ever had a had a plan that extended beyond Plan A, which is why I think they're at like Plan Number uh, Plan D or E at this point. But. Um, yeah, I don't think they really expected to be at that, uh, be where they are. Um, I think we learned a lot. And I, like I said, I told um, anybody who would listen in the spaces, I'm not jealous of any, I'm not talking bad about any coach that applied, like no. after they heard, you know what I'm saying? That sure. They could be, because ultimately you, you want to get paid for the passion that you have, like, you when you're passionate about something, of course you you do it for free, but you want to be compensated for it. You know, and so um, if 90, 90, <laughs> 90, 000 000 things, right? <laughs> I understand. I told them I understand. If you got ninety thousand reasons to go somewhere and do what you are uh, passionate about, then I t you got to take it. You yeah, take it. I, I'm with you. Um, you know, Coach Smith, let me ask you this question. And what's the average that you know of? And I'm not obviously asking you to tell us what you make, but, you know, what what, what do high school football head coaches make in Georgia? No, there, there's, if you, they printed it out in the um, paper probably like six or seven years ago. There's, there's at least 25, 30 of us that are making well over 100 in the state of Georgia now. Um, it's 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 several ways that you get it. I mean, you one is we're not ten month uh, as coaches. We're paid 11, 12 month pay schedules, as opposed to ten month. What is happening in Bar County? You know, our stipends, just the the coaching stipend alone, you know, is you know ten thousand dollars plus. You know, to be a head coach in, in in most Georgia schools. On top of that, twelve month pay schedule. Um, they do other things. I mean, here here in the state of Georgia, your booster club can compensate you on top of that, whereas that's not the case in Bavard County. You know, Bavard County, they might be doing it, they might not, but if they are, they're not supposed to be in Bavard County compensating you. Um, so there's you can you can get paycheck there on top of that. Um, you know, so it, it's you're going to see most of the coaches in the state of Georgia getting 90, you know, in the 90s. That's not unheard of easy. Um, but the bottom line is this, you know, I'll go back to this. Well, why do the coaches in Bavard County do what they do? Look at them. The most of them are graduates. Michael, graduate of Bavard County. You know, he's a Bayside High School graduate. He grew up in Bavard County. Why did I spend all that time in Bavard County? I was a graduate. I was a Palmy High graduate. I spent time in Bavard County because I grew up there. I enjoyed everything I did. Um, I don't take anything back of what I did in Bavard County. But when you get to the point where you have kids that are going to college 
and you start to go, hey, I'm, I'm a few years from retirement. I might have to be working at Publix, you know, when I retire because my retirement paycheck's not going to cover my cost of living. That's when you start to go, you know what? I worked my butt off um, and, and I helped a lot of kids get the opportunities to play in college, but Bavar County didn't help me get an opportunity to retire. Um, and that's re that's reality. I mean, and I'll say it to the school board. I'll say it to the superintendent. They do not compensate the coaches for the time that they put in. Of our county coaches have worked their tails off yep. for the last 25, 30 years and get peanuts for it. That's the bottom line. All right, guys, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to wind this thing down. All right. So I'm good. You all get the same question. And the question you start off with is, I'm the, you know, just like the presidential state of the union, the state of Brevard County High School football is, and you fill in the blank, and then I want your closing statements on what you think is going well and what you think needs to change. And uh, I'm going to start with you, Coach Franco. I think the number one thing that has to change is the school board – uh, the school board needs a, a football coach that sits up there with them that, or not just a football coach, but a coach, it, it, an athletic needs, board, an athletic, not a County AD. And it should be a revolving door. If the specialty fits a certain coach in a certain area, I mean, these coaches know, I mean, when I have, has Brevard public schools ever had a round table with all the head coaches, I of football. I'm not sure. I like I, – listen, I think Kevin Robinson like, does a I terrific mean, job, um, too. Yeah, and then the quick story is, no, they haven't. Um, no. But about 4,000 things could be solved of just pulling your head coaches in and just asking them their opinion on certain issues, asking them their opinion of, should we build a multi-bajillion dollar middle school right next to Vieira, or is there maybe something else we could do that doesn't cost us to have to do facilities? So I think – I think the school board, if you ever, if you want to start thinking ahead about NIL, if you want to talk realistically about transfers, which we only, Bavard does backward ass transfer rule versus everybody else. We pretend like everything's closed for all these different periods of times. Like, like where is the coach's involvement in Bavard Public School? You don't see it. <laughs> and the I mean, state, I and, and, and I haven't even met the new county AD. I, I don't even remember his name. It kept. That was it. He's Ke Kevin Robinson, and I will say this: I, you know, I know he does a ton of work up there covering all these sports. He does a terrific job. But let me fill in the blank: the state of Brevard County football is talented. All right, there you go. All right, let's move on to Coach Benson. Start off: the state of Brevard County football is. I'm gonna have to agree with 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 Franco. It, it's super talented. I mean, kids come out of here all the time to big colleges. And as you see the last, what, four or five years, we had a, a kid in Brevard County that's in the Super Bowl. So, I mean, we put out talent, whether it's just not even talking about football, we're talking about track, we're talking about swimming, whatever it is, it's, it's in every sport in this county. And what would you like to see changed? If, you, if they said, Coach Benson, you get to change one policy in this county, what would it be? Policy? I don't, I don't know about policy. It's just about no, if in terms of in terms of in terms of, in terms of football. Care. Just the level of care about it. You know, we we have just for instance for what kind of takes me off with with the Bavaria County. We have a group of four or five guys that take care of Bavaria County's fields. Right. Right. So they have to go to every Bavaria County in. You know, every Brevard County school would have cut their grass. So there's times where during the season, during the spring, where I'm up at the school on a lawnmower, cutting my grass, lining my field, getting ready for the week, right, along with my, my coaching staff, right? Those are the things that people don't see, you know, where I'm spending my Sunday away from my family, away, or my coaches are spending their, their Sundays away from their families. Like the level of care, um, when it comes to stuff like that, you know, and um, I, I want to see a little bit of change, but I, I just, I don't think it's going to happen. Honestly, Billy, I'm going to ask you a different question because you're, you're involved in the youth. You broadcast with us on Friday nights. As you look at Brevard County football as a whole, from the youth to the high school game, 
What would you change? And if I said to you, the state of Brevard County football is what you fill in the blanks with? I mean, so for me, Alan, for changing, I mean, obviously it's it's the quality of coaching. Um, you know, when I was when I played for Melbourne in my first couple of years when I coached at Mel High, like there were seven, eight, nine, ten guys on, on campus that were your coaches. You know, kind of back to the discipline thing with Martell, like you knew you couldn't, you know, mess around because your history teacher was your, your offensive line coach. You know what I mean? Now it's a lot of community coaches, and, and I'm not knocking those guys. You know, my dad's put 19 years into the to, to the system as a community coach, but you know, getting these coaches back on campus and 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 staffs that are bigger with with coaches on campus for me would be better for the high school. And then the youth level, just, I mean, I know Coach Smith did it when he was at Vieira. I mean, some of these high school coaches don't don't support the youth level. You know what I mean? They they don't they don't try to come you know help develop these coaches too, not just the athletes. Come develop these coaches that that are there coaching their future players, you know what I mean? Yep. Uh, I tell people all the time, Brevard County Youth Football is hurting for coaches because, you know, I could say just my program at West Melbourne, we had guys that that stayed at one division, at 11-year-old division for 20-plus years. Now it's the next dad to move up. He just moves up with that team every year. You know, these kids aren't facing different type of coaching styles. They know that every year, you know, they're going to get Coach Palmer and Coach Durfus, and, and we're going to run the same offense. We're going to play bully ball. You know I mean? Like, Kids need different styles. So for me, that that would be, you know, what I would like to see changed. Uh, and the state of Brevard County football as a whole from youth to high school is? I, I just say under underperforming. And I'm not necessarily saying that the football is underperforming, the support from, from parents through administration. Okay. I like it. Um, Martell, because I got a different question for Coach Smith since he's up in Georgia. Okay, Martell, the first part of that – the state of Brevard County football is what? I think the playing field is evening out. Um, I, I think the, because I'm a avid Titusville supporter, we we are, no. we are treading up. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> like it, it's it's evening out. It, it may take a while, but you know it's it's, it's evening out. What would you like to see? I know, I, you know, listening to you, I know you, you often come up with some things and some really good ideas, but if you were cornered and said to pick one or two things you think have to change moving forward, what would it be? If I was going to say anything had to change, I would say, uh, I would say the, the fake offers would have to change. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> like, because, and here's why, here's why I say that the fake offers have to change because it, it's, it leads on realistic expectations. Yeah. It, it leads on and it makes people think, you, you know what I'm saying? They get from ninth to 11th grade, they're receiving, Oh, every D one school across the world, is offering them a scholarship and then when it comes time to sign it's oh they didn't have the grades oh they didn't have this or they didn't have that or the school stopped calling which sometimes is real but if you just didn't have to give these fake ego offers then um we probably wouldn't have those problems so i i think if we could do away with fake offers uh that would be cool. Um, I think the co coaching across the board is being great. Like, uh, it's a lot of young guys out there that are position coaches and coordinators that are coming up, and I think they're doing a good job. Okay. I, 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 uh, I listen before I get to Coach Smith, I, I want to make sure I thank all of you guys for coming on tonight. All right, Coach Smith. I, I, I got a friend of mine that was in Louisiana as an athletic director for a while. He's back in Florida now, and uh, I kind of got his take on uh, what Louisiana thinks of Florida high school football now. Talked to a guy in Alabama about it the other day. What do high school football coaches in Georgia right now think about the state of high school football in Florida? Well, we're first going to say fast. Fast. I mean, it, it, all the guys that, that I'm associated with and have friends with up here now I don't lie to them, man. I said, look, man, Florida gets off a bus. It don't matter what school's coming to you. They're coming to you with speed. Um, you know, but what they do talk about is, holy crap, how could you coach down in Florida happen to look at your dang Twitter account every 14 minutes to see what your kid's following, to see who's recruiting your kid and where your kid might go next week. Um, that's stressful. Um, 
I know, I know you guys, you can't, you're saying it's stressful. I know it is that to, to, to have this worry where your second string quarterback is going to go because you're not playing them enough or where's that third receiver going to go on a four, four receiver package because the first two receivers get more catches than him. That's stressful. And that's what as George's coach is talking about is, is how would we deal with that stress? I know how to deal with it because I did, but the coach, a lot of coaches that have had careers up here, they've never had to deal with something like that the stress level of a kid transferring when he wants to based on just the fact that he wants to. Um, there are some beautiful comments thrown out there. Martell, I'll, I'll piggyback off you. That offer ain't real until their junior year, man. If they, if, if you if you hear of a kid getting an offer, first thing a head coach should do is look at that coach to extend that offer to him and go, if he gets, commits tomorrow, is, it, is he good? If the coach hesitates, it's not an offer. It's not an offer. If the, if the coach – says, I am offering you a scholarship. The first thing you look at that coach and says, all right, my kid wants to commit tomorrow. If that coach hesitates, it's not an offer. He's throwing his cast net out there with the hope that maybe it might be an offer. That's BS. An offer is a committable offer. That's a true offer. When a kid can commit, that's an offer. I just want you to know you would be, you would be kicked out of spaces for saying that. <laughs> 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 it's the truth. I mean, if you, if the kid can't commit, it's not an offer. It, it, it's it's an offer to look at you or evaluate you further down the road. That's what we're offering to you, um, Benson. I love the fact that you said care. Um, that's what you want as a coach. You just want somebody. You want not just your family, your coaching family. When I say your coaching family, the parents, the players, the the immediate administration that you associate with you. You want somebody else outside of that to also care. You want them to care that you put all that time and effort in to change young men's lives. That's what needs to happen in Bavar County. More care. People that care about the state of the field. Why is there four guys mowing 18 high schools, 22 middle school fields, and wondering why you go out to practice you're in knee-high grass with mosquitoes biting you from head to toe? And 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 care that that you know, when they do mow your grass, you got to go get the goats out there to chew up all the, the, the extra grass laying on your field, things like that. Um, what is the state of Bavard County football? Talented, but there's it's the land of the have and the land of the have-nots. I, I, I agree with that statement. Um, I do also agree with the state. It's weird for me, which is why I wanted to have this, because there are some weeks I absolutely love what's going on, and there's some weeks I hate what's going on. You know, I mean, it's crazy to me. Um, how we spent more time covering stuff off the field last year than a lot of stuff that was going on it. And at the high school level, gentlemen, to me, as a guy in the media, that just should never be the case in high school football unless it is National Signing Day. That's just my thoughts on that moving forward. I will tell you this, that I want to do this with basketball coaches because, oh, my God, is it so badly needed uh, for basketball coaches and even a referee or two. I'd love to have that forum with basketball coaches. Gentlemen, I cannot thank all of you enough. Is there anything, anything at all that you could think of? I know we didn't solve any issues, but is there anything that you could think of that we, we need to talk about that we didn't talk about? Anybody? I, I want to say this. Coaches – have each other's backs man um the bottom line is y'all not going to get that care unless you all have each other's backs in the recruiting world to have each other's backs it is when a college coach walks into your office michael and he starts talking about you know kids that you got in your office tell them about kids at bayside tell them about kids at palm bay tell them about kids at the north end at titusville and astronaut because the bottom line is the more that you spread the love in Bavar County, the more you might get that care. Um, that's the biggest thing that is we can do to our coaching community is don't be against each other, be a for each other. The week you play each other, oh well. You know, bottom line is that week we're enemies, but when when you're not playing each other, you got to be a team, man. If we, if we as coaches can't be one team except for the week we play, then how do we expect to get that support and love for, and, and the care that we want from everybody else? All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, gentlemen, um, I'll I go ahead. Bring, go, go ahead. I think, I think I can agree with that. Um, I definitely think that uh, a little bit more unity is needed. <laughs> <laughs> People think that I'm a creator of chaos, but I'm really, I'm really trying to diffuse a lot of the situations around here. Put fires out on a weekly basis. Uh, Coach Franco is a fire starter. 
as well as Ray Kamika. He's a fire starter too. <laughs> you got, I'm, I'm not starting fires. I'm holding people accountable. <laughs> So I tell Frank, you what, I, I got a text from from somebody to ask you a question. Go ahead. <laughs> Can O'Gala get on a schedule? <laughs> oh my God! Here we go. All now, right. See, now that's a fire starter right there. there You're right. Go. Exactly. Exactly what you just preached against. Right. Right. You all gonna get three thousand yards. We'll think about. You, you all gonna get me? All right. I almost Maddie through here without getting in trouble. Thanks, Billy. All right, guys. Um, I appreciate y'all. I, I really do. And again, uh, let's not, and, and also let's not let this be the last time we do this because I think it's important after this NIL comes in, I think we need to jump back on and do this again. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I'm going to cut all you off now and uh, have a great night. All right. Um, I want to thank everybody that joined me tonight. Uh, Coach Derek Smith. I want to thank Coach Michael Benson. I want to thank um, Coach uh, Billy Palmer, Martel Stevens, Adam Franco, and all of you out there for being a part of this here tonight. And again, I want to do this for girls and boys basketball as well. I'd love to have three girls coaches or two girls coaches, two boys coaches. I want one official, maybe Steve Muzzy from the MCOA, and let's have a forum and talk about the same issues with high school basketball. So, Thanks to all those guys, and thanks to all of you out there for allowing us to come into your homes tonight to talk about the issues as it pertains to your student-athletes. Again, yesterday, congratulations to the uh, 35, I believe, 36 or 37 student-athletes uh, from early signing day to yesterday that signed national letters of intent. Uh, 27, 28 different schools, 11 different states. It's impressive, but keep this in mind, two years ago, it was 58 on this day. As college changes and the recruiting changes, you will see that number continue to drop. So at this level, things must be done. And things must change to get that number back up steadily into the 40s, 50s. And five years ago, it was at 63. So there you got it. So again, thanks to all those guys out there. And listen, to all of you have a great night. And again, I want to remind everybody, Brevard Sports Network is powered by Natwick Insurance. I want to thank Eric Natwick for all he does. And join me tomorrow at 5 o'clock down at Club 52 from 5 to 6 tomorrow as we will, uh, I'm going head-to-head -head with Mark Moses for a sports trivia contest. Mark's going to be giving away two, uh, two Daytona 500 tickets. It's sold out. So come on down to Club 52. Watch me beat Mark in sports trivia. And then tomorrow night right here on the network, We've got FHSAA 3A Region 3 uh, Soccer. We've got Holy Trinity and FAU in the regional semifinals. And our very first lacrosse game of the year as uh, Vieira starts that gauntlet of a schedule tomorrow night hosting Winter Park. So let me make sure I remember everybody. Martel Stevens, Billy Palmer, Adam Franco, Michael Benson, Derek Smith, Caleb Brown. I'm Alan Slaughterzinski. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow night.